Is it this? Yeah. So Johanna's pointing out a type of sea anemone called an aggregating anemone, and there's actually a really pretty large one there that she's pointing to at the end of her finger. That one might be about to split in half. So the aggregating anemones can have the ability to reproduce basically by cloning themselves. So on this big rock here, there are probably hundreds of anemones that are all basically clones of themselves. And this big one she sees here might be about to do that sometime in the next few days or weeks or I'm not sure, but it looks larger than the rest of the anemones around here. So that gives me a clue that it might be about to reproduce. But these anemones have a really interesting relationship with algae. Um, so they use zooxanthellae, which are a type of algae that could live out in the ocean, um, a dinoflagellate, and there's also a chlorophyte, a green algae. And instead, that algae lives inside the kind of body of the sea anemone. And the algae is able to produce sugars using energy from the sun and water and carbon dioxide. And the algae gives some of those sugars to the sea anemone, so the sea anemone gets extra food out of it. And in return, the sea anemone provides a really safe place for that algae to live. Um, so that is an example of a mutualistic symbiotic relationship. So that means that both of the organisms benefit. It's a smiley face, smiley face. It's good for the sea anemone, and it's good for the algae. Now it's known to happen in these aggregating anemones that we have here, um, but it's also possible that the type of sea anemones that live in Kachemak Bay, the burrowing anemones or moonglow anemones, sometimes we see them and they have bright green tentacles. So it hasn't been proven by science yet, but it's possible that they also have some of that symbiotic algae living in their tentacles and photosynthesizing. Johanna, you're doing a great job pointing at the anemone. Do you want to try touching those tentacles around the outside? No. So it's kind of wise to say no because those tentacles are the stinging parts of the sea anemone, right? That's what they use to paralyze their prey. But for humans, our skin is much too thick, so we don't really feel the sting at all. I'm going to try to do this without dropping the video camera. There's that big one we were talking about. Oh, it feels just a little bit sticky. And back in here are some smaller ones. There's one here in the shade. And the reason it feels a little bit sticky is that those nematocysts or stinging cells are just barely going through the first layer of our skin and then our skin is too thick and they can't get all the way in. So we're not able to feel the sting. One more thing about these aggregating sea anemones that's kind of interesting is that sometimes there'll be two different patches of them and the one patch will be all related and the other patch will be all related um, but they won't be related to each other and those two different patches of anemones will actually kind of battle with each other um, and sting each other so they won't sting their clones but they'll sting unrelated sea anemones and so that's an example of a kind of relationship in the intertidal zone that's all about competition so they're trying to create their own territories and they don't allow other sea anemones to move into those territories if they're unrelated. And there's also, we talked about clam siphons earlier. You can see a clam is pulling in water, filtering out the plankton. You can see those little bubbles and a little spout coming out there. Hey Johanna, come look closely at this. If you look down in this little tiny tide pool, you can see a small and amazingly beautiful animal down there. Do you see that? Yes. It's kind of orange and, and blue. a little bit of blue. And some, and some white. Yeah, so this is an opalescent nudibranch, and they are one of my favorite animals. They're also called a sea slug. They are a mollusk without a shell. So they're related to like the clams and stuff, or the snails, but they don't have a shell. But one of the most amazing things about this nudibranch is one of the things that it will eat. So I don't know 
if this is its specific food over here, but nudibranchs can eat sea anemones and especially a sea anemone relative called a hydroid. And those have stinging cells, but it doesn't bother the nudibranch. So this nudibranch can cruise along and it can come up to that sea anemone or a hydroid or a soft coral and eat the stinging tentacles right off of it, no problem for the nudibranch, and then take those stinging cells and process it through its own body and put it on those serrata, so those kind of finger-like feathery parts that come off the back of the nudibranch. It's taking the defense mechanism from the sea anemone and using it for itself. How cool is that? So it's like um, those orange lines are the are skin part? Yeah, from the thing that it's ate. It'd be like if you ate a porcupine 